So, welcome to our midweek podcast, and this week I'm joined by Red Pill Junkie. Hello. And for the first time, Adam Go Rightly. Hello. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. And uh, we had decided, uh, I've had a few requests for it, and um, Red Pill and I have been talking for a while about doing a show on Carlos Castaneda, so we figured you were the per- perfect person to uh, ask to join us, Adam. Perhaps, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll We'll see. <laughs> Why don't you give people who are not familiar with you a little of your background? Oh, boy. Uh, Kind of uh, when I got interested in strange stuff, kind of dates back to when I discovered uh, Castaneda. I was uh, in the 70s. I was in my teens, you know, so that was the prime period when uh, Castaneda became uh, known. And I was thinking about this earlier today. but, you know, I was interested in the counterculture and the occult and all that uh, stuff back in my uh, early teens. And, you know, the psychedelic movement, and stuff that had come out of the 60s, kind of as in the 70s, took a more uh, new agey bent. And uh, as the, the two ser- uh, series of books, you know, if you were into that scene back in the day were... They were the Lord of the Rings, Tolkien's book, and the uh, Carlos Castaneda series of books. Uh, and so, yeah, they were kind of a revelation for a lot of people back then. And if you were ahead back in the day, and uh, those those were the uh, books a lot of people were tuned into. So, uh, so yeah, myself, uh, uh, that's, that's some of the ba- things I was interested in, you know, growing up in. The uh, being in my teens in the uh, 70s, and uh, I've also talked on other shows uh, quite a bit <laughs> about a, a psychedelic UFO experience I had, and that kind of uh, propelled me on the uh, path of looking into paranormal conspiracies. And uh, uh, in the 90s, writing for a lot of zines, like that's where I met Greg Bishop. In fact, in the mid 90s, wrote a rather long, ridiculously long uh, piece on <laughs> Castaneda that I think was like 10,000 words, and Greg uh, <laughs> broke it into three parts. And uh, mm. it's also in, uh, I just pulled it out today, Wake Up Down There, the, the uh, excluded middle uh, collection, that thing I did on Castaneda in there, and was titled Tr- The Trickster of Truths. And so, yeah, working on zines and stuff in the 90s. I wrote a, uh, got interested in the Manson family story and a lot of the conspiracies revolving around that. And that resulted in the first book I wrote, The Shadow Over Santa Susanna on the Manson family. Then have done a number of things since then. Then on uh, a book on James Shelby Downard and quite a bit of stuff on the uh, Discordian Society and Robert Anton Wilson, and so, uh, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Nice, nice. All right. Um, and Red Pill, why don't you, you tell us how you got into Carlos Castaneda? Well, uh, here in Mexico, uh, there's a, a long series of uh, esoteric magazines that have had a very long run, and that I uh, was very fond of reading since uh, I don't I, I won't say my early childhood, but at, at, at least since my early teens, you know, uh, Spanish uh, pu- published uh, uh, magazines, and I say Spanish as is because they were published in Spain, uh, and ah. these were these were magazines like uh, Año Cero. Más allá, espacio y tiempo. So it, it, it's funny how here in Mexico we we kind of receive that th- these kinds of influence from uh, across the the Atlantic uh, instead of like uh, the magazines that you guys were probably reading uh, uh, back in the day that were published in the United States. So getting back on track here. Uh, in those kind of esoteric Spanish magazines, the name of Castaneda was mentioned quite often. And that really spurred my interest and say, okay, who, what is this about this guy, Carlos Castaneda? And then when I got in college, 
I think I uh, talked about uh, that with um, uh, uh, a friend of mine who had read his books, so that even uh, sparked my, my curiosity even further. So I remember once going to the library, uh, I guess I was uh, uh, looking for information for to, to do a homework or something, but then after I had finished that, I decided to uh, see if by any chance there were any books uh, from Castaneda uh, in, in our library. And what do you know? I actually managed to find uh, his very first one, The Teachings of Don Juan. It was an, uh, uh, an English-speaking edition. So I, uh, I took that home and I was really hooked. I don't know why the material had a heavy resonance on me. So I, I ended up reading the first uh, books, that, uh, what, what I consider his uh, tetralogy, you know, his first mm -hmm. books, which are Teachings of Don Juan, A Separate Re Reality, Journey to Xtlan, and Tales of Power. And, you know, it was really like a, a, a really long story br broken down into four uh, different uh, books that were, that were written, I think uh, there was a span difference of a couple of years or something, perhaps between one and the other. And then uh, in 1999, like many other people, I went to the movies and I saw this sci-fi movie by the Wachowski brothers called The Matrix. <laughs> and The Matrix <laughs> really blew my mind. And I think the reason why it has such a in big impact in it because I saw a whole lot of correlations and similarities between uh, Castaneda's philosophy and the movie. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, uh, Neo, portrayed by Keanu Reeves, was like Carlos, you know, this young apprentice that... that finds this uh, elderly teacher in the books is uh, Don Juan, this yaki uh, uh, brujo, you know, this uh, shaman that, that from uh, northern Mexico. And in, in the movie, of course, is Morpheus. And Morpheus uh, gives uh, Neo the famous uh, red pill that obviously I took it then uh, uh, like my, as my nom de plume. And, <laughs> and in... Uh, because I found such a, a similarity between the red pill in the movie and uh, the peyote that Don Juan gave to Carlos at the beginning of his apprenticeship, you know. And this idea of using these uh, psychedelic substances, or in, in, in the Matrix case, the red pill, in order to break down reality, you know, to, to wake people up from this dream world we are inhabiting, and to let them see the real uh, nature of reality. And, and, and you guys remember in, 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 by the end of the movie, and I don't know if I should say spoiler right here because it's, it's a movie that yeah. is so, so old, <laughs> but by the end of the movie, Neo sees the agents and the rest of the Matrix as, as these like lines of information. And that is also very similar of what the ultimate goal of uh, Don Juan's practice was to see the universe as uh, lines of energy and to see the human being as a, as a, as a glowing egg. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, so because of that is uh, that I've got, uh, I don't know, a, 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 such a confirmation from seeing, okay, so at least somebody else found this material just as interesting as, uh, as I did, you know, and, and maybe that, that's the reason why I decided to name myself the Red Bull Junkie. Oh, nice. uh, hundreds of thousands of people in the U.S. back, you know, there's yeah. a lot, lot of folks in the counterculture and interested in psychedelics. He was huge, you know, back during that yeah. uh, period in the early to mid-70s. I mean, he made the uh, cover of uh, Time magazine and yeah. just was... Uh, incredibly successful and he had the stamp of academia with his first book it was published uh, -huh. uh from uh, ucla mm -hmm. and endorsed by academia there and so when this book showed up it was like wow this is the real deal you know and uh it even you know, came across there's like an a, a an appendix in the back that really gets it's really rather dry <laughs> part of the uh, book but uh 
So all of it had this stamp of authenticity to it, you know. That's another yeah. thing that attracted a lot of people to it during that period. Plus, Castaneda was this uh, very uh, charismatic, mysterious figure, much uh, like Don Juan, it seems. And as uh, by about mm-hmm. 1972, uh, he basically uh, kind of become quite the recluse. And there's very few photos of him. You can find a few on the web. So that kind of added to the intrigue, the mystique of this guy, Carlos Castaneda. Mm-hmm. And, and, I mean, Simon Schuster, I mean, it was a bestseller for them. Like, I think mm-hmm. the first four, at least, were. Yeah, the, the first edition of the book was through uh, the uh, UCLA Press, whatever the name was. And I think yeah. S- Simon & Schuster picked it up, and they republished that first edition, then the, that, or the first book, and then the uh, subsequent books. And he made uh, a lot of money. It sold v- very well and continues to sell quite well. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, what was the figure I saw? It's sold a ton. Just like every year, it's still all the books still sell a decent amount. They've never, never been out of print. Yeah, and that article we were talking about before we came on air, uh, it's from like Salon in 2007. I, yes. think, I think the figure was uh, around 7,000 every year, which is yeah, still qu- like quite that. a bit for books that were written, you know, 30-plus mm-hmm. years well, ago. Well, that and all the the other stuff that's come out about Castaneda, which yeah. we'll get to. Mm-hmm. Um, and my first introduction to Castaneda was sometime in the '80s. A friend of mine who was really into psychedelics and stuff had lent me the book and said, "Oh, you got to read this." And I read it, and I was not impressed. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I didn't really like his stuff. I thought it. I I felt like it was fictional, and I kind of dismissed it. But then bits of it stuck with me. And so even though I had dismissed it, I was kind of like, well, you know, that was kind of interesting, and that was kind of interesting. And then I picked up a few of his books and read through them, and I'm like, you know, I don't know if this is true or not, but some of this stuff works. And that that was kind of the thing. Like, it, it didn't matter so much to me whether these stories were literally true. He, you know, and I mean, we know now that he picked up a lot of this stuff from other genuine teaching systems. Yeah. Yeah, and kind of morphed it all together, so that makes sense. That that's why some of this stuff works so well because it was you know from real uh, wisdom teachings. Yeah, he took a lot of Eastern mysticism, Western occultism, uh, New Age ideas, and kind of repackaged them. Or you know, Red Pill was talking about some of the stuff. Like uh, one, I was kind of re- refamiliarizing myself with uh, Castaneda today, and he had these things about erasing personal history and stopping the mm-hmm. world. It was kind yep. of renaming, uh, you know, what happens in meditation with stopping thought and erasing personal history is like the ego loss thing. And it kind of ties in all, a lot of this thinking to what happened later on down the line when uh, we can get to that uh, later, you know, a little bit later if you want, where he yeah. kind of had a cult grow around him. The, uh, the, the one of the ones, the two things that I always felt had a lot of uh, power behind them were the idea of petty tyrants <laughs> and how to deal with them, yep. as well as just how, how much self importance plays into everything and how to eliminate that, that sense of self importance. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've always considered uh, Castaneda's work, and, and it's interesting now the listeners will hear like three different versions to spell his name. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, getting back to it, uh, I see it m- first and foremost as a, a Gnostic ph- philosophy. Mm. You know, the, the idea that is obviously harkens back to for thousands of years and also that well, had a huge influence in the early years of Christianity. The idea that uh, the world, the material world is like a prison that was built by this evil entity mm-hmm. that like uh, overtook or, or replaced the figure the, the, the figure of the real god and and in the case of castaneda and also this uh, a similarity with the matrix this idea that this prison was created for the benefit of these entities that predate uh, uh, prey on humans you know that they 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 feed on us they feed on our 
emotions, our fears, our angers, and that's why they want us to keep to keep us in prison, and they don't want us to uh, learn the truth uh, about about the real world, which is what uh, in Castaneda's philosophy that's the real. Uh, the ultimate goal of, of, of the shamans, of men of knowledge, as, as they are called mm -hmm. in the books, is the idea of, of trying to get out of the system and, and to attain uh, what they call as complete freedom. Mm. Yeah. And, and, he, and he had that, that concept that most people are, was it a dragon that would eat them in death? The eagle. The eagle. Okay, mm -hmm. right, right. I, I think dragon, the dragon is in Chinese philosophy. There's a similar type of concept. Yep. Um, but yeah, the eagle would eat them. But if you were a, a, a sorcerer, you could you could avoid being eaten and, and therefore have that sort of eternal life where you're not stuck back into the system again. And that, that you find, too, in a lot of black magic type of uh, teachings where they're like, you know, you have to follow these teachings in order not to be stuck in this cycle anymore and so on and so forth. Yeah, part of what I got from it, and once again, I was re-familiarizing myself with some of the uh, material that's uh, in the book. I, perhaps it was Tales of uh, Power, where he, uh, Carlos gets beyond that fear where <laughs> he can free himself and be able to see and become a man of knowledge when he uh, mm -hmm. jumps off the cliff into the abyss, which, you know, is yep. uh, <laughs> obviously that uh, connects to Western occultism, occultism. Crossing the Abyss, he knew all this and, you know, those yeah. books. And uh, what he was also uh, was a uh, hell of a novelist. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Harlan, El Harlan Ellison pointed that out uh, years ago, which I found really interesting because Harlan Ellison uh, is a pretty strong skeptic and is, you know, the first to call bullshit on a lot of paranormal uh, stuff. And uh, that he was so admiring of Carlos Castaneda, I found it was quite uh, kind of surprised me. But if you look at those books, they are especially the early ones are uh, masterpieces. Some of the uh, characters, <laughs> the story, yep. it's the stuff that sucks you into it. Uh, I think now I haven't thought about for years the character not only of Don Juan but. Don Gennaro, he was like the yeah. ultimate trickster, <laughs> doing yeah, all these yeah. crazy things. It's it's wild uh, story. I think as they progressed, you know, the books became more and more far out, you know, so it, yes. pulling people along. How much are <laughs> you going to accept about this? And I think uh, as they progressed, they weren't uh, as, as profound to me. I think they started to get uh, watered down. I even heard, you know, and I don't know if these rumors are true but some of the later books uh were kind of ghost written by other people and i i can see that in them the uh his voice is very strong in the early books and afterwards uh not so much to me but once again it's been years since i've read a lot of those yeah i also think that uh after the the first four and i uh, don't claim to have uh, uh, read all of them you know just uh, mm -hmm. it's interesting like uh, trying to find them wasn't that easy, you know, but then every so often I will, one of those books will, you know, er erupt into my life, you know, almost <laughs> like it was something that I, I needed to read at that moment. But yeah, uh, getting back to it, um, as we get introduced to more and more characters and situations, you know, the thing gets too convoluted. And yeah. what's interesting is that... Uh, the idea is that uh, Carlos is trying to reconstruct all these events that, that uh, according to the story, happened to him while he was in the company of Don Juan Circle, but uh, all, this, uh, all this while he was in what he called the, uh, the second attention. So this was a different uh, 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 level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. in which he was interacting with all these people in who, and he was having all these crazy adventures, but he completely forgets, you know. I mean, I, the, the, in the books, there's always this idea of Don Juan going, getting behind Carlos and wham, giving him a huge, 
whack in, in, in just in the, in the middle of the uh, of his back, you know, in the in the solar plexus, and that's how he managed yeah. to shift his attention, you know, to this special level of of consciousness in which he was ready to take in the, these deep lessons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and what do you make of that, Adam? The the strike to the back. <laughs> <laughs> He's given a whack to the uh, Kundalini uh, going yeah. on there. <laughs> yeah, Could yeah. be. I've heard you talk about that before, and I had had kind of similar uh, Kundalini experiences. At least I think they're connected to that, as well as astral uh, projection. So that's you know, the Castaneda books got into a lot of uh, that realm too. Once once again the. Uh, language was different he you know he's not using he's not calling things astral projection or kundalini or anything you know that was in uh, the popular culture then he was coming up with these terms that he claimed came from the uh, shamans he studied under you know mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so uh perhaps but uh you know at the end of the day it looks like uh on some level, you know, while there's a lot of uh, truth in this, uh, that's why I called the article I wrote back when called The Trickster of Truths, that <laughs> it was all uh, made up, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that, that, it, it, it sets him apart in some ways because of that, because he had such a deep, profound effect. The stuff he, he is supposedly teaching works in a lot of levels. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But it was all fiction. And even still, though he had debunkers coming out in the um, 70s, uh, the first was Joyce Carol Oates, who I think replied to the uh, Time magazine article. Then in 76 or so, uh, Richard DeMille came out with a couple of books that uh, pretty exhaustively uh, point out all the consistencies in the different uh, books by uh, Castaneda. And so, you know, as you're into the mid to late 70s, there's been all this material questioning him, but uh, he still continued to become a, or was still a popular force back then, and people sure. were still, uh, you know, uh, reading his books and uh, looking to him as like a guru of uh, some type of movement, new age psychedelic uh, movement, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. though, and... You, but uh, I guess by the second or third book, he kind of Don Juan had told him, uh, "You don't didn't need the drugs anymore." You know yeah, that door yeah. had been that door had been opened for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's the end of the third book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, at the beginning of the of the fourth book is when he goes to Don Juan and says, hey, "Don Juan." Why did you force me to to take all these power plants at the beginning of the apprenticeship? And and Don Juan <laughs> as, uh, answers because you are an idiot, <laughs> because you your energetic body needed such a jolt that there is no other resort, or maybe you know the, no quicker resort than than using the the power plants. And that probably was maybe it was uh, in reaction to the fact that you know. Carl Castaneda knew that psychedelics is, was, were starting to become less popular in, in the culture mm -hmm. and maybe saying, okay, so if I want to keep my readership, I need to come mm -hmm. up with other stuff yeah. that won't get them arrested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Never good to have your readership arrested. And yeah. uh, that Don Juan character was always uh, great at popping Carlos's bubble, you know, like when he did, yeah. got the first book up. Uh, published and took it to Don Juan supposedly and was all proud of it and Don Juan <laughs> said I, I, the only thing I'd do with that is wipe my ass with it you know yeah. <laughs> which is kind yeah. of like, like the Zen teacher that tells you exactly what you don't expect to hear and when you first hear it it's like that makes no sense or that's very insulting and the later he go, thinks about it and it's another aha moment with a lot of the inscrutable things Don Juan told him along the way that later, I guess, made some type of sense to him. Yeah. You know, at the, at the, well, at the beginning of our, of our conversation, uh, Adam, you said that uh, the counterculture movement had two really big books that were, like, spurring the whole, the whole movement. And one of them was 
uh, aside from the Castaneda's book, was Lord of the Rings. Now I'm wondering if uh, if young <laughs> readers thought of Don Juan uh, as a real life Native American version of Gandalf. <laughs> oh, of course we did. Yeah, there was nothing to tell us he wasn't. You know, once again, mm -hmm. it had that first book had the stamp of academia on it, and we. You know, Everybody wanted to believe in it anyway, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, I mean, I, especially you're, you're in your mid-teens or so, uh, you're more <laughs> willing to uh, buy into uh, something like that. Hey, why not? It was fun, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I had read those first four books, and I was fairly impressed, and still thinking that it, it seemed fictional, but like I said, it worked. The stuff made sense, and yeah. uh, then I picked up, I think, the fifth book, because you know, around here, especially in the in the eighties and nineties, these they they were in used bookshops everywhere oh, for yeah. a buck here and there because they were bestsellers. Um, and I read the first book of the second four, and just was completely unimpressed but, with it. I thought, well, I think eh. I was too at the time. I remember that I was totally turned off. as like, ah. Eh. It, it almost seems like after the fourth book, he like ended it, like ending a story, and then said, "Oh, people want more. Let's make more to the story." And I was yeah. kind of like, "What's <laughs> happening here?" Yeah, kind of similar to what happens to uh, contact contactees. You know, I mean, they have the score story that may have a kernel of truth, you know, but then the contact probably ends. And people are still hungry for more, so they have no yeah. other option but to stop, st start faking, you know, mm -hmm. the contact and start I, hoaxing photos. Yeah, I was or, I was thinking of this uh, today about parallels and um, with Castaneda, supposedly, according to I think this was in the book written about him by his first wife. Her name was Margaret Runyon. I think that's mm -hmm. where I read this, where in the late 50s, he was actually he was working on a fictional thing about a, <laughs> a Don Juan-type character. Mm -hmm. And you can find more material about the, in that uh, book by her, The Name Escapes Me. And it kind of reminded me, it was a parallel to George Adamski, how in uh, the late 40s, he had uh, basically, you know, prior to the whole Orthon hookup, he had written mm -hmm. this uh, fictional account uh, that pretty much mirrored his later so-called experience. Mm -hmm. it, it was a fictional title called Pioneers of Space, I think, and he sent it to Ray Palmer at Fake, Fate Magazine. It got rejected, and of course, later, uh, later years, uh, skeptics and whatnot discovered this and went, oh, aha, he's already cooking up this thing, uh, you know, several years in advance. Yeah, yeah. I had the name of that book right in front of me, and uh, I don't know what I, where it went. <laughs> Which book's that? Uh, the one his ex-wife wrote. Yeah. Uh, um, it actually sounds like the name of one of his books. <laughs> so, or it sounds like something he would have written. It's well worth re reading all the uh, books of that nature on uh, Castaneda, the Richard DeMille books, if you can find those, and uh, Margaret... Runyon's book, I think that's her name, and also the one that came out a little later than those by Amy Wallace, which is really quite uh, revealing, and that's called The yeah, that's, Sorcerer's Apprentice. Yeah, that's that's sitting right in front of me, right here. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and that, Not the book, the name of it, just as you were saying that. Yeah, and that... I'm looking at the name of the other one there. And that tells the story how she was, uh, by her own account, manipulated and abused to a certain extent. We're talking about mental abuse by uh, Castaneda, which is similar to some of the stories that uh, Richard DeMille had heard in, back in the uh, 70s. There was one account in one of his books. Gosh, you know, this is <laughs> pulling this out of my brain. It's been 15 years or so since I read <laughs> this stuff, but it was an account where uh, Carlos uh, hooked up with some... Uh, young lady and uh he was she was gonna be his apprentice and uh and so uh you know going along quite well quite charmed by castaneda uh, apparently he was a very charming charismatic uh guy and at some point uh he came back uh 
he'd been gone for a couple weeks. She's wondering what happened to him, and he looked very agitated, and he said he'd met with Don Juan and that she had to get rid of her dog and all this other stuff. And it was evident that he was, you know, playing games <laughs> with people or he might have been a, a little mentally. Who, who knows what was uh, going on? I think it's even possible that uh, there was a bit of a uh, – sociopath in Mr. Castaneda. I know a lot of people don't want to hear that, but perhaps. Mm -hmm. Well, it it seems like he, you know, he, he, he hit a home run with this book Mm -hmm. and he, you know, other than to make money and get his name out there, he didn't necessarily do anything horrible starting off. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing, you know, other than maybe the fact that he pushed this as an, as a factual account when it was fiction, Yeah. but the stuff in the book is very positive. It's not stuff that's going to hurt people. And, you know, yeah. And, and like I said, it works. The stuff is, the stuff is effective if used properly. I mean, it, it because he took it from legitimate wisdom traditions mm-hmm. and such, mm-hmm. but it seems like at a point he realized, you know, he was it. And that's when he started becoming that cult leader sort of personality. Yeah. You know, the power went to his head because, I mean, even early on, people said that he was incredibly charismatic. They, they, he was the type of person that he didn't even have to talk to you and you liked him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, indeed. You know, he just had that vibe to him. Yeah, and why the why the change came about, who knows. But, um, but you know, I hadn't heard about Castaneda for years, and I got interested in him in the mid-'90s, and that's when I wrote that long uh, article, and that's when I became aware that he had kind of reemerged in Los Angeles there, and he would had this group form around him, and they were having, like, public workshops for uh, – and. and or performances, rituals, I'm not sure what you'd call it for a technique they call, called... Yeah, they, they call, call it ma- magic passes. Yeah, and the... T- well, let's and go with magic, magic yeah. passes. The group, they also called it... What, what you just said, it tends to... Ten secreting, yeah. Ten secreting, Which yeah. is actually a, a, a word that was coined by uh, this great architect, Buckminster Fuller. Yeah. So this was a little bit prior to his death, and I started seeing some of this material, and you can see the photos now. He had these uh, young ladies, most of them, uh, you know, had cut their hair short, and you see them at these uh, these uh, workshops and kind of martial art looking, uh, performing these different magical passes and stuff, and as you learn more... Uh, most of these uh, women had uh, changed their names, and there was a small group that lived with uh, Castaneda there in Los Angeles. Uh, and so I, as I was discovering this stuff, this was, you know, mid to late 90s, and then in 98 he uh, passed on, and that's when the story got even a little bit more bizarre. Yeah, I actually read two, uh, the two books written by those two women in his Inner Circle, Florinda Donner Grau, I think was, mm-hmm. and Taisha Abelard. And it was yeah. kind of weird because uh, it, 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 it was like uh, reading the, the, the same story <laughs> from yeah. a completely different point of view. In fact, they give uh, Don Juan and Carlos uh, different names. Like mm-hmm. they, they claim that they didn't know the, uh, the real names of until after, you know, they, they were... Uh, further advance in the apprenticeship. And it was, yeah, they, they also had ventures with Don Genaro and all these other uh, groups of brujos who were part of uh, 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 Don Juan's uh, uh, group of, 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 of brujos, the ones who, uh, according to Carlos Castañeda's main story, managed to break free and, and, you know, and became like, I don't know, immortal beings or, or, or whatever. And, and supposedly Carlos was going to be the new Nawal, that's the name of the leader. Yeah. The new Nawal for this other new group that, that Don Juan was forming around him. And these women were all part of him. There also was also a, a woman by the name of Carol Teeks, yep. who was like the uh, La Mujer Nawal, like a, a woman who had like this, his, the, the same level of energetic power uh, 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 as, uh, as he had. And they were supposed to be the new leaders of this group, but uh, apparently something went wrong. You know, Carlos wasn't able to do it. And, and the way he explained it is because 
in the end, he didn't have the the, the necessary like uh, energetic uh, reservoirs or something that will mm -hmm. and enable them to pull the feet of, of of breaking free from 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 reality. And that's why you know he kind of like uh, decided not to follow in, in in Don Juan's footsteps and and to start to to give away these you know secret uh, uh, magic passes that uh, supposedly have been created since the time of the ancient Toltecs <laughs> thousands and thousands of years ago. So this story is that they, they had this great civilization of wizards that ruled over Mexico before any of the sanctioned you know, cultures in Mesoamerica. And that's why he came up with this... Uh, uh, clear green organization yeah. and selling up the, all these um, uh, videos, you know, to, to train people in these magic passes. The magical passes, once again, it seems like he was borrowing from other things, are very much like Tai Chi, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tapping into the Chi force. And uh, yeah, I'm glad you're here, uh, Red Pill, to <laughs> pronunci pronunciate everything like the Nagal. <laughs> I always thought. The Nagal and uh, whatever. <laughs> um, and and the thing is, the the lore he created also said that sorcerers didn't get sick. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. And so there was one woman who got kicked out of the group because she had uh, she had gotten sick with something, and they tried to hide it. And as soon as he found out, he kicked her out of the the group. And then when he got sick, they tried to cover that up. Because obviously he couldn't be the the man of power he was and be sick, right? Yeah, because he died of cancer, didn't he? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, and uh, you know who knows what was going on with the inner circle, but uh, apparently that uh, you know there's a couple of versions that probably upset those uh, ladies that you know he he could actually get sick and died and. Uh, but then the uh, popular spin they were putting on it was that they were he'd gone off to whatever the uh, <laughs> whatever that mystic land is that uh, shamans go and the women were going to join him there and uh, shortly uh, afterward they all disappeared and the suspicion was they all offed themselves. One of the uh, folks in his group, I think the name was Patricia Parton, was found. Uh, mm. In Death, Death Valley, yeah. yeah and they they haven't found, uh, as far as the rest of the women, I don't think they've ever uh, found what happened to any of them. Although at the same time, apparently no one ever looked for them because they had cut ties with their families and, you know, erased their past. Yeah. yeah. So when they went missing, nobody cared. I mean, because nobody, they weren't connected to anyone. Yeah. That, that's a good point. And there was... Um, at that time that there, that was going on, I was part of a uh, seemed like an email group. Uh, somebody who was associated with uh, what was it called? Clear uh, Clear Green. Clear Green. Yeah, and there was a lot of questions about who was in charge of the Clear Green estate, and I never yeah. followed up on any of that. But it was yeah, it was a very uh, strange situation. Mm -hmm. um, and he had died of liver cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, which completely ruined this uh, 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 legend or image of him as being an, an impeccable uh, <laughs> man of knowledge. Yeah. Because Don Juan supposedly, you, you you really never get to know how old is he. But he's this uh, man who looks like he's like. 70 years old, but he can perform feats that not even a 20-year-old can do. And the way they hear the story, he, he's at least 100 years old, right? You know, yeah. Along with Don Genaro. So, so yeah, that completely uh, was running contrary to, to, to this, the, the, you know, the magic of the story. And, and according to the Salon article... Uh, the media didn't learn of Castaneda's death for two months. When the news became public, Clear Green members stopped answering their phones. <laughs> they soon placed a statement, which Jennings says was written by Wagner, on their website. 
And it said, Fort Don Juan, the warrior was a being who embarks when the time comes on a definitive journey of awareness, crossing over to total freedom. Warriors can keep their awareness, which is ordinarily relinquished at the moment of dying. At the moment of crossing, the body is in its entirety is kindled with knowledge. Carlos Castaneda left the world the same way as his teacher, Don Juan Matas, did with full awareness. And it said obituaries had a curious tone where the writers did, seemed uncertain whether to call Castaneda a fraud or not. <laughs> they, they probably didn't know whether to believe that statement or, you know. Well, was that too. <laughs> or maybe they didn't know how, how powerful Clear Green was so even whether they were going to be sued. Well, true, true. It, it, um, it sounds similar to uh, Scientology when L. Ron Hubbard died. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. And once again, uh, with uh, people of that stature die and you got a pretty big estate, you know, there becomes a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff going on that we'll never hear about. Hmm. And it says, Castaneda's will, which was executed, executed three days before his death, leaves everything to an entity known as Eagle's Trust. Hmm. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's coming back to me. That was, yeah, that was the questions about the estate because people who yeah. were looking into this stuff and were even kind of involved with the uh, Castaneda group uh, didn't know who this uh, entity was. What what was it? Eagles. Uh, Eagles Trust. Yeah, they weren't sure who who was uh, running the uh, state or the trust at that point. As I recall, this has been you know a number of years. Yeah, yeah, and it's, I mean, it, it's such a clear-cut cult at a certain point, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and it's so easy to 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 trace to to kind of twist these rather positive teachings into a control factor for this cult. The thing that uh, struck me, yeah, there's a lot of things obviously that point uh, to a cult. The changing of names, you know, you can see yeah. that happen in all these groups, like the Manson family. Not, you know, not saying these folks are murderers, but it's that whole uh, erasing the past, where you know, Castaneda or Manson or whoever, L. Ron Hubbard, becomes the central figure in everybody's life. His mm -hmm. his child his children basically he names them, and they become his <laughs> lovers and family, and you know. Yeah, because and, at, at the beginning of the of the apprenticeship, there there's the idea that uh, the man of knowledge needs to really t uh, have to store their in, in precious energetic reservoir, and that you lose that uh, when you engage in, in, in sexual sexual intercourse. But then mm -hmm. at, at some point, Carlos said, "No, no, no. You know, actually." Actually, Nawales are exempt of that, you know, so, yeah. so it's okay if I, you know, fool around with you guys, you know. <laughs> you shouldn't do that, but we think it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it, all, it happens to all Guru. Well, a lot of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah and it, it's, it's really unfortunate when you look at this stuff and the, and the stuff he did to some of these women and some of these people in the group um, – they were talking about how he would pull other people back in, even though they didn't want to return, because he he was just so good at this, yeah. This uh, whatever it was he was doing. Well, in the in the philosophy, it's called stalking. You know, mm -hmm. apparently, uh, men of knowledge could either become uh, dreamers. You know, people who uh, perfect the act of dreaming. You know, entering mm -hmm. to these alternative worlds through dream time and there was this these others who were the stalkers you know who were using uh i don't know psychological manipulation you you can call it in order to achieve their goals and in order to fool people mm. yeah like tricksters um, yeah yeah um it says in talking and again in the salon article uh this woman cadium was talking about, uh, it said, you know, she was devastated when Castaneda banished her from the Sunday sessions, telling her, the spirit spit you out. <laughs> um, Ouch. And she said she eventually recovered and now remembers this as the most exciting time of her life. Mm -hmm. According to all who knew him, Castaneda was not only mes mesmerizing, he also had a great sense of humor. Um, you know, I mean, so <laughs> it's, it's not even, I mean, it was definitely a cult, 
but the the even when he damaged these people, they still didn't necessarily look back on it and be like, "Oh, I'm so glad I'm out of that." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. They they were saying saying about basically he freed them up for making decisions. Wallace was the one that said that. We were free from the tedium of the world. So, <laughs> but it's like it, it it's. Yeah, it's such a difficult character to wrap your brain around. Yeah, but maybe you you shouldn't, you know? Like you said, why I I understand why people get obsessed with with his figure, you know, or even the, the figure of Don Juan whether oh, try, some people are still fighting whether he was completely fictional or not or whether uh, the the character was based on 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 some real uh, person i think uh, that read somewhere that maybe castañeda based uh, the character on the figure of maria sabina you know this mm-hmm. this mazatec uh, uh, woman living in, in oaxaca mexico who was you know so uh, good at using uh, mushrooms in order to perform her her practice but uh, like you guys said you know the work it, it, it uh, the body of work, it's a great story, but, but also, also still contains a lot of valuable stuff yes. that you yeah. can apply to your life, you know, even from a philosophical point of view, the, this idea of living an impeccable life, of trying mm-hmm. to go about your life as if you were a, a warrior going a, into battle. Follow a path of heart. Can't exactly. go wrong with that. Yeah, yeah, and, and take responsibility but, for your actions. Much like uh, Crowley's true will, you know? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, well, that's one thing that got me about a lot of the books, you know, and after a, two or three you're wrestling with, is this, you know, all made up? Or, But then, you know, you'd read, uh, Red Pill had mentioned before, you know, things he would bring up in his book, like the Illuminous Egg, <laughs> mm-hmm. which was basically an allusion to the orb. It was like... Well, okay, maybe he's seeing the aura and a number of other things. Like uh, he talked about power places or sitio. Yeah. How, do you, how do you pronounce that, uh, Red Pill? Sitio? Un sitio, uh, yeah. And uh, which was, you know, another parallel to feng shui or something like that, you know. So mm-hmm. uh, he was mm-hmm. definitely steeped and had a pretty, pretty vast knowledge of the occult and, all, you know, all of these things. Oh, he certainly did his homework. There's no two yeah. ways around no, sure. about that. I mean, um, but it, like that that quote with the human aura, it, uh, DeMille quotes a passage um, by a mystic yogi, Rama Shakara, that says the human aura is seen by the psychic observer as a luminous cloud, egg-shaped, streaked by fine lines like stiff bristles standing out in all directions. Yeah. Yep. And in a separate reality, Castaneda says a man looks like a human egg of circulating fibers, his arms and legs like luminous bristles bursting out in all directions. Yeah, I mean, that, when I read the, that line from the DeMille book, I went, oh, okay. <laughs> I see what he was doing there, Castaneda. Yeah. yeah. But he, he's taken all these different pieces from different different teachings and putting them together into a story mm-hmm. that works. Yep. Yeah, par- apparently an inspiration. This was according to his wife, and it was uh, around fifty-eight or fifty-nine. They they read, uh, and she was into all this stuff uh, with him during that period. They had a back then. A, both of them had an interest in the paranormal and these type of subjects, and they uh, stumbled upon that Andrea Puharic uh, book, The Sacred Mushroom. And she said, <laughs> after he read that, something happened with. Uh, Carlos, he changed and he started uh, leaving for trips to Mexico mm-hmm. quite often. And he, when he, when he'd return, he'd never talk about what he was doing during that uh, period. Mm-hmm. So he was definitely out there searching for something. It seems like what yeah, what, he, yeah. what exactly he found. Uh, whether he did find a Don Juan out in the world or found uh, Don Juan within himself is you know. Not totally clear, but uh, yeah. Do you guys knew, uh, know that um, Castañeda was going to make a movie with Federico Fellini? <laughs> that, really? that would have been wild. Yeah, and apparently uh, 
was going to be something about uh, showing the, the the Mayan ruins of Tulum and other places, hmm. and it never came to pass. But uh, this uh, famous uh, Italian uh, comics writer, I forgot his name, but he actually made a, a, a graphic novel about a, a, out of it. It's called Dream of Tulum. And mm. uh, and in and, and in in that uh, he shows Fellini and he also shows uh, Castaneda. Oh well, that'd be an interesting collaboration there. The, yeah. Uh, apparently, for years and years, you know, there's been options on. Uh, uh, what was the first book again uh, titled the uh, the teachings? The teachings of Don Juan, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I heard at one time the uh, Anthony Quinn was slated to play the role, but uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to, uh, interesting subject to tackle one way or another, the Don Juan story or the life of Carlos Castaneda. Yeah, yeah, they would definitely both be interesting. I mean, if you, if you did the story as if it were, you know, if you presented it in the story form, it would be interesting to watch, just like reading the books were interesting, mm -hmm. but it would also mm -hmm. be interesting if someone tried to take on Castaneda's life. Yeah. You know, in, in that sort of I w movie sense. I would merge the two together, and at the end of the story, you're not clear <laughs> hmm. who is who and what is what, if there was a Don Juan, and, you know, leave, leave, have... leave a little bit of mystery there, but uh, combine, you know, both stories, Castaneda's life and Don Juan as a perhaps real character. Yeah. Mm hmm of course, it, it would have to be a mini series, I think, at that point. Yeah. <laughs> to get all the information in. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, that seems to be the way to go now, you know, with uh, all the interesting work. I don't see all the interesting work, but you've had these long series that have been really well done from Breaking Bad on down the line, you know. So, yeah, that would be a good uh, format for the uh, castinated Don Juan story. So, you know, same thing with Twin Peaks coming back. I hear they're gonna, they're slated to produce uh, two or three seasons. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I, I knew they were doing the one. I didn't know if they were doing more. Yeah, I think I just heard they uh, went and signed for more. So whoever network uh, he's working with uh, apparently liked what they saw enough to <laughs> chill out some more money. I don't know. You guys remember that that crazy ass uh, movie, Altered States? Yeah, <laughs> which I, I actually happen to like, and obviously yeah. the movie is based in, in majorly of, in, in the work of John Lilly and and the and the sensory deprivation tanks. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's also elements uh, in, in the movie that seems to have been inspired by Castaneda's early books. Mm. Uh, I, I remember uh, uh, reading it. I think it was. Probably the first or the second one, how at one point of the, this ceremony that Don Juan was performing to, to create this uh, psychedelic brew that then he gives uh, uh, Carlos to, to, to drink, he uh, reaches for his arm, he grabs his hand, and without any warning, he goes and he cuts him, you know, right in the palm. And he then uses the blood that is flowing out of, uh, of Carlos, poor Carlos's hand to, to pour it into the brewing mix that he, he was cooking. <laughs> and then he gives that uh, uh, nasty thing to Carlos to drink. And that, that same thing happens in, in, in the movie when, when the character playing by uh, John Hort, I think is, is his name, goes to Mexico, you know, to, to try to get the... the, the Ma the, the secret of these um, magic mushrooms that are from uh, uh, a group of fictional, uh, a fictional tribe that I think they, 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 they were kind of like portrayed as the Tarahumara in, in, in the uh, part of Chihuahua in Mexico. But yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm curious to try now to think of other movies which might have been influenced by, by Castaneda's books. Oh, I'm sure there's tons because yeah. I mean he had such an impact yeah. on popular culture that it, it's almost unavoidable. I never would have made the connections with uh, the Matrix like you did. <laughs> I I never made that uh, <laughs> connection. Yeah, but I can uh, see that. One thing we were talking about, you know, was any of his books harmful? 
and it just brought to mind uh, perhaps in the uh, it was in the first or second book you know he's trying these different uh, psychedelic type concoctions and yeah. one of them contained gems and weed it was a mixture of some stuff you know and I was going oh that's yeah. interesting maybe I should uh, look into gems and weed which uh, you really don't want to mess around with so hopefully uh, people weren't uh, trying a lot of gems and weed cuz you that, mm. you can get a real bad uh, trip from that stuff really yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> you'll lose your mind for several days or you know go blind and stuff there's some crazy cases and gems and weed uh, grows wild in a lot of places oh huh. interesting um you know, I mean, and there's so much legitimate stuff when it comes to, uh, you know, psychedelics and, and shamans and stuff like that. Do you think it did any harm um, when he was writing this stuff to the legitimate uh, shamanism down there? Uh, maybe. I mean, I, I surely there were a lot of, you know, <laughs> well, cra cra crazy I, hippie gringos that were trying to look for Don Juan and pestering the poor Yakis, right, in Sonora. Exactly, yeah, that's what I was going to say. There was, I heard there was a lot of that going on for a certain period. And I think, uh, you know, in some areas, people went crazy going into uh, Mexico and pulling out peyote, you know, like it was uh, no, <laughs> going out no, of style. They still do that. <laughs> yeah, which, which isn't easy to grow back in some places. You know, yeah, so. unfortunately, no. They, uh, somewhere in the Salon article, was talking about how people were going down to, to and were accosting the Yaqui Indians yep. uh, oh, about all this stuff. And the Yaqui Indians were like, we don't, we don't do peyote. Exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's one of the things his critics pointed out. It's like, no, this doesn't really match up to any Yaqui uh, Indians, you know. Yeah, which is a so, problem because the subtitle of the first book is A, a Yaqui, Yaqui Way, of, way knowledge. of Knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess if Don Juan was an actual person that he was getting this from, Don Juan could have lied or had been a Yaqui Indian who went a different way with it. Mm -hmm. Or Castaneda wanted to conceal the actual person or tribe you know, he was actually dealing with, so he came up, used Yaqui instead of uh, giving away you know, uh, what tribe or whatever Don Juan was actually yeah. with to protect him. Because... Uh, if we believe in Don Juan, Don Juan yeah. didn't want a bunch of uh, people coming around. He chose who were going to be his apprentices. Yeah, and it and says uh, the, the idea is that in the in the end, Don Juan uh, tells Carlos that uh, his uh, um, knowledge, the knowledge of his lineage of of, of of men of knowledge, really doesn't stem from from the yeah, it stem from the the ancient Toltecs. Mm, mm -hmm. It says, uh, J.T. Fikes, author of Carlos Castaneda, I'm sure it's Carlos Castaneda, uh, <laughs> or actually Miguel is, well, I'm probably saying it correctly, <laughs> um, academic opportunist in the psychedelic 60, 60s, believes Castaneda did some, have some contact with Native Americans, but he's an even fiercer critic than DeMille, condemning Castaneda for, his effect, for the effect his stories have had on Native peoples. Following mm -hmm. the publication of the teachings, thousands of pilgrims descended on Yaqui territory. When they discovered that the Yaqui don't use peyote, uh, but that the Hucholi <laughs> okay, people do, they headed to their homeland in southern Mexico, where, according to Fikes, they caused serious disruption. Fikes recounts with outrage the story of one elder being murdered by a stoned gringo. Jesus. Great, yeah. Now, I, I have that book, too. It's been years since I've... Uh... Read it. Another complaint was that uh, when Carlos was at UCLA as a anthropology uh, student, he knew some of the folks that were looking into this type of research who were traveling to Mexico and working with shamans. And uh, Carlos had access to a lot of their field notes and materials. One of them was uh, Peter First, F U R S T, and he's uh, he's written a a couple of uh, books, and he they felt that you know they he'd uh, kind of ripped off their or borrowed liberally from their field notes, uh, attri yeah. attributing them to himself. So yeah, if I was one of those uh, student anthropologists, I wouldn't be too happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the same time, can you blame him for what other people do 
in that sense. Like, no. like not so much the stealing, but for people going down there and accosting these people, that's not necessarily his fault. People sh- should, A, be responsible for their own actions, and B, know better. If the people are going to do that, if it wasn't Castaneda, it was some other thing that would... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so it's stupid people are going to do stupid stuff, you know. Yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, yeah. Mm -hmm. Looking for enlightenment. I'm sounding like an elite elitist here. (laughs) There are. (laughs) Um, So, I mean, to me, a lot of this, like any of these teachings, to me, you take the stuff that works and you leave the rest of it. I don't. I don't believe in wholly following anything. Um, You know, I, I really like Crowley's work, but I don't. You know, go. I'm not a Crowleyite. I just I think some of his stuff works. I, it works for me, and I think everyone's a little bit different. Some of Castaneda's stuff works great for me. I don't know if it will for other people. Obviously, it has for plenty of people. Yeah. But I think everyone needs. You know, I think it's fair to look at the stuff and pick what works for you and leave the rest. I, I, you don't have to go whole, all the way in. You know. One of the things it just did for Grupa people heads i was <laughs> running around with back in the day and reading this stuff just generated some great conversations about uh you know the castaneda books and other uh philosophers and whatnot we were into that you know just made us think <laughs> you know there was yeah. always in the back of our mind is you know this is a real story or not but then you know you talk about certain aspects of it and uh so it was uh Castaneda was kind of a gateway drug <laughs> or that <laughs> yeah. got people into a lot of these uh, ideas. Yeah, and, I, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, I sure know that because of, of, of his books that I decided to try to see if I could uh, achieve. Uh, yeah, uh, I was, I was doing that. <laughs> In fact, yeah, that that's one of the things uh, for sure. I hadn't thought of it, but I had some success lucid dreaming. Yeah, and one of, one of Castaneda's, however we want to pr- pronounce his name, one of his things with when you feel you're going into the lucid state to try to uh, maintain that state is you uh, hold out your hands and look at them. Yeah. And <laughs> I actually... And that works. It well, works. it's... For a while, then you, uh, yeah. I remember doing it this one time, and it was like, oh, now my hands are getting really weird, and I was gone from the <laughs> lucid state. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah, yeah. No, that de- that definitely worked for me. I mean, I, yeah. you know, if you can train yourself to, and I think it would work with anything. It doesn't have to be your hands. Your hands are just sure. an easy target. Yeah. At the same time, you could say, "Look at your feet." Oh, because once you have that deliberate intention in the dream, the dream can then become lucid. So that was the point of Castaneda. It could be the hands. It could be <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and but that's the thing. This stuff does work. So take it as as it is. And it's unfortunate that it all kind of. I mean, some of it sounds like the Heaven's Gate cult near the end. Yeah. You know, and and. Getting back to this idea of maybe one of but, the reasons why he chose to to keep the people guess second guessing about whether it was all true or not, or whether what, how how much of it was fiction, how much of it wasn't. Maybe there's something about that about leaving people in that level of, of uncertainty that ma- manages to trigger the magic, for lack of a better better term you know the, i'm thinking right now of uh crop circle artists you know i think yeah. the crop circle artists know that if you go to a person and say you know what i did that that crop circle i'm going to show it prove it to you without beyond any question that i did that circle they don't do that because they want to, they keep people uh still with the wonder not because they want to i don't think because they want to fool people and say, ha ha, those gullible crop circle believers, but because they know that uh, it's kind of like the placebo effect, if you know what I mean. It's like mm-hmm. keeping that that level of belief in, in, in people, that which manages to trigger something within our minds that opens up to, to f- something that is quite real, even if the origin of it 
happens to be fictional. Not only that, but people who make these crop circles have had so many unusual experiences themselves. Well, yeah. And who knows you know. if, if Castaneda himself also ended up having <laughs> weird experiences that he couldn't oh, account for. I bet. And to be fair to Castaneda, what do we know about him other than what we've read about him? It's like, uh, yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure a lot of it's uh, true, but it's like, you know, the uh, mystique that grew around Aleister Crowley, you know, a lot of that was uh, <laughs> just a bunch of... Uh, myths and things uh, his enemies made up about him. So, yeah, we'll never really know the uh, truth. We just get uh, bits and pieces of it. I do know somebody who uh, ran across Castaneda. It must have been on the campus of UCLA years and years ago. And oh. what? Well, they didn't really talk, but he, they just passed by, and he looked in his eyes, and this uh, guy told me, yeah, there's really... <laughs> Something special and uh, intense about the look the look of the guy. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, well, again, people said he was incredibly charismatic just mm-hmm. being around him. It wasn't that he was just, you know, manipulative and could, you know, soothe people. It was like instant, just his energy. And that happens with people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times it happens with cult leaders. Yeah. Yeah. But, but even like... Uh, the, the the last Bush who was president apparently was very charismatic, you know. For all that people hated him, I, I you know, people would say, you know, when they were alone with him, the, he was incredibly charismatic. He was very likable. I've heard that, yeah, from uh, yeah. people who have met him. Uh, he's a, yeah, he's just a good old boy when it's a one on one situation. Yeah. So I mean, some people just generate that that sort of very positive feeling of energy around them. Mm-hmm. They make you feel good and you like them. Yeah, some people have said that the same thing about someone like the Dalai Lama. And in fact, now that Adam is here, I know that you uh, interviewed once uh, Chica Bruce. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And you guys were discussing this idea of of obscene Tibetan lamas as psychic vampires, you know. She she brought that up. (laughs) I know. Really? I don't remember much about it, but yeah, there was uh, there was some faction of uh, Tibetan lamas that were, yeah, kind of practicing some sort of uh, black magic, psychic vampirism. Yeah. Hmm. You can I'm... you can find more on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> except... You can find more of everything on the internet, except that actual interview because it was mysteriously erased. Oh yeah. Really? Okay. It's coming back to me. I've been to <laughs> I've been to Tibet and uh oh. heard the heard the monks chant chanting. It's quite a uh intense, uh somewhat uh, surreal experience. And I you know, I could see how you could in, interpret anything on your <laughs> Sure. <laughs> on what how your brain reacts, you know, you could interpret the chanting as a wonderful thing. Or an evil thing, or be indifferent, sure. be indifferent to it. Um, and when you compare like Castaneda and Crowley, the difference too is that Crowley reveled in people making stuff up about him. <laughs> Maybe you know. <laughs> well, uh, I, I get the uh, with Castaneda. Who knows? I'm sure he loved the. Uh, he must have because he cultivated this mythology around himself. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, but then he kind of removed himself. That that was part of the mystique, though. Yeah, yeah I guess it is. Hmm. Well, any, any, anything else we've missed here, Red Pill? Hmm. Um. I remember okay. reading in the first book this concept of uh, uh, diableros, the idea of these evil shape shifting. Mm-hmm. Brujos in, in northern Mexico. That now that I think about about it, it sounds quite a lot like the the concept of the skinwalker that we have mm. heard a lot lately in paranormal circles. Uh, yeah. Interestingly enough, that that those concepts no longer are uh, repeated in in the in the rest of the books. But I remember how that fascinated me when I first read the first one. 
Yeah, and as the books progressed, it, it became, uh, you know, uh, more evident yeah, that uh, it was kind of a good and evil thing going on sometimes with these people who, I forget all the stories now, wasn't there some witch that was after uh, Don Juan and Carlos got in the middle of this and uh, people were turning into wolves and different things? Yeah, but apparently <laughs> that, 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 whim, that witch was actually part of uh, Don Juan's circle. So it was kind of like a test. To yeah, help, okay. You know, it was all a trick. Uh, hmm. one, another thing was uh, Mescalito, who, oh, yeah. which, which parallels to the Green Man. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like a nature spirit that comes out when, uh, for instance, uh, taking peyote, you tap into this... Uh, nature vegetable green <laughs> mm -hmm. spirit and uh interestingly enough uh robert anton wilson had the same experience and this was before uh the castaneda books were published in the early uh 60s and wilson writes about this in cosmic trigger he uh started sending off for uh peyote and experimenting with it back then yeah you could uh, wherever he uh could send in a few bucks and get a shipment of peyote sent to you. Yeah. And uh, at that same time, he was kind of living on a commune-type uh, state and doing gardening. And <laughs> he was out one day, and this was like, you know, maybe uh, the day following a peyote trip, and he saw a uh, green man walk across his field of vision. Interesting. Much like, right. much like Mescalitos, as I recall, is described in those Castaneda books. Yeah, it was and, like and, an anthropomorphic peyote man, cactus man. Mm -hmm. and, and he saw that green man, when it wasn't clear whether or not he was actually using the peyote at the time, was it? Uh, it sounded like he had used the peyote a day or two before. He'd been, you know, experimenting with it quite a bit, so he was uh, quite possibly still under... Some type type of influence in his system, or he triggered something in his mind that allowed him to see a green man that day. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like Terence McKenna's uh, vision of this Adamski-like flying saucer. You know, yeah, uh, it's not like at that moment he was uh, uh, eating the mushrooms, but you know, he had been eating mushrooms <laughs> like crazy with his group <laughs> during months, so obviously, you know, he, well, his whole bloodstream must, must have been saturated. with. Or like, <laughs> uh, you know, in the uh, books where uh, Don Juan says we don't need the drug anymore, we've opened the door. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, well, one part of his philosophy that I have never really understood quite well was this concept of the inorganic beings. Hmm. I vaguely remember that. <laughs> yeah, apparently. Yeah. They're, 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 oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess it was. Yeah, I, I guess it was something akin to Terence McKenna's, you know, elf uh, machine elves. Were these the allies? Well, yeah. In the end, you realize that the inorganic beings are the allies that he had mentioned on previous books these uh, uh, entities that the uh, brujos will be able to like uh, uh, ally themselves in order to 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 carry on tasks uh, but uh, these definitely were non-human entities that live mm -hmm. in a yeah. separate dimension which uh, brujos could get into, you know, either through power plants or through, you know, other other means. See, it's funny, all these terms, the brujo, brujos and allies and all this stuff, you know, we'd be sitting around smoking a joint, <laughs> talking, about, <laughs> talking about these, all these terms that were straight out of Castaneda, you know, and they meant <laughs> something to us. We yeah. could have, have deep discussions. <laughs> <laughs> about it, you know. Same thing with the city. Oh, this is my power place, man. I feel good here. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, I know he also inspired. Uh, there's a fictional book called The Way of Weird uh, that Brian Bates had written, and uh, he took a lot of stuff from Castaneda in writing that book, as well as other like um, Druidic, because um, it, it takes place in England. 
mm-hmm. when the Christian missionaries are coming across. But you can plainly see the the Castaneda influence in the book as you're reading it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, there's been a bunch of books that seem like they've been influenced by him. What's that really popular one called The Four Agreements or something like that? Oh, yeah. Never read those, but yeah. It's it's not too bad, actually. And this guy, yeah, he claims the guy who wrote him to be some type of Toltec shaman from the lineage of Castaneda. And, you know, you can mm, believe that. that as much as you want to. But the book itself has some good stuff. And it seems some of it's reminiscent of, uh, you know, the kind of uh, Don Juan philosophy. Interesting. I've not heard of that one. Yeah, and and if someone uses the term Toltec, then chances are that (laughs) he was definitely uh, (laughs) influenced by by Cassini. Obviously, Toltec is was an actual uh, culture that lived in central sure. Mexico. Uh, not that really that long ago, but they were definitely here before the, the, the Aztecs. And Toltec, if I remember my Nahuatl correctly, means artists, you know? <laughs> so that's, that's why, you know, it was kind of like a compliment, you know, uh, uh-huh. to, to, to name people using that term. Hmm. All right. Well, Anything I else? Up the sick? four agreements, and it says, "Oh, I, I pulled it." Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. I pulled up the four agreements just to give you the uh, little blurb about it. It's called "In the Four Agreements." Don Magui, M- Miguel. Miguel. <laughs> Don Miguel <laughs> Ruiz <laughs> reveals the source of self-limiting beliefs that rob us of joy and create needless suffering. Based on ancient Toltec wisdom, the Four Agreements offer a powerful code of conduct that can rapidly transform our lives to a new experience of freedom, true happiness, and love. (laughs) It was on the New York Times bestseller for seven years. Sold 5.2 million copies. Good heavens. You know what amazes me though is that you can you can come up you can make something like this up even if you're taking none of it from ancient sources and it can work but unless yeah. you say it comes from ancient sources nobody's going to take it seriously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, or, for, or from the uh, uh, what's the, the the records the uh, Akashic oh, records called it's the, the Akashic, the Akashic records? records yes of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Well, even even the you know Jane Roberts Seth material. As much as I was against channeled stuff, when I read that stuff, I was like, okay, this isn't like other channeled stuff. This is actually really interesting. And she herself would yeah. say, I don't know where this is coming from. It could be coming from some part of my unconscious. I really don't know. Oh, what if Carlos Castaneda channeled the books? <laughs> <laughs> channeled Don Juan. Channeled, he met him yeah. in alternate consciousness. <laughs> but you know, it's like I, I with was the into Seth books. Those, uh... The question is, if Jane Roberts had written that stuff out as her own theories on things, I don't think they would have sold. But as channeled material, people ate them up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. And I mean, I don't, I, I, mean, I don't God, sense. She... Huh? I was going to say I don't Go sense ahead. any right. any uh, like deception on their part. They seem to be fairly open and straightforward, and they didn't make, become millionaires off of it. They didn't start a cult. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so it, I, I believe that she believed whatever was happening was real, even if she didn't know what it was. But like I said, if she has just yeah, I written... used to reach out. Go on. I, I kept, uh, keep stepping on, keep stepping on you there, but I would written to, uh, Jane Roberts back in the day, I used to reach out to some of these people and I'd kind of forgotten about that. And I pulled out her, uh, I guess a book called Seth Speaks. That was probably her uh, most famous one. Re- one, and I got I had sent a letter to her, and I got a postcard back, and I forget what year it was, but it was from her husband, informing me that she had just died. Oh, and no. wow. there was some more information in there, but I probably a year ago or so I hadn't seen that book in ten or fifteen years. I pulled it out, and oh god, I forgot all about this. But anyway, that's a sidebar. Huh. I I had actually tried reading, I, well, started reading A Way Toward Health, which is the one that, the last one she did as she was in the hospital, and it's it's hard to read. Mm-hmm. Not because the information is bad, but you can just feel like his heartache as this as she's laying there basically dying. Yeah. 
Mm. You know, there's there's one entry apparently he forgot about, like it just got lost, and he found it after she had died. And you know, he's he's a very good writer, and when he expresses how this made him feel finding this, you're just like, wow. Mm. Need to read this. Yeah. Some good stuff. Yeah, I would check out Seth Speak. Something about it's one of those books that seems to resonate for some reason. You know, the early Castaneda books, or you know. Whatever mm-hmm. you want to name, something special about that book. I'm not sure I could <laughs> could read it now again, and probably couldn't put my finger on it. But uh, it seemed like it was a true vision from her, whatever it was. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and it, well, it you know when when I read it, I tried to debunk it. Yeah, because I had such an aversion to channeling, and <laughs> yeah. I couldn't. There's nothing that she wrote that can be flat out debunked. And unlike other channeled entities, it's not all vagueness. It's very specific and detailed. You're like, okay, so modern science is actually supporting the stuff that she's saying (laughs) or that Seth is saying. And it's like, all right, I don't know what to do with this. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Yes. Just take it at face value at that point. It's worth something because the stuff in it works. The stuff she's talking about seems to be accurate, regardless of what the source was. Yeah, it's Mm -hmm. interesting how some books end uh, end up resonating with you and others uh, don't, you know. And and now I'm remembering how uh, I encountered the Castaneda's books at a very rather difficult moment in my life. You know, I was going through uh, problems because I kept I kept getting fired or or uh, quitting from from jobs to jobs. So I was really, really unstable. I had problems with my family. Yeah, uh, it was a, it was a rough patch in my life. And for some reason, the the books um, helped me, you know, emotionally. You know, gave me some kind of mm-hmm. uh, uh, emotional stability. I I, I yeah. don't know why, but they did. They gave you a way to see things differently. I guess they, maybe they, they maybe they they. Gave me confirmation that I wasn't that crazy in assuming that this world <laughs> is not really the end all be all of everything, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And and that was a huge comfort for for someone like me. <laughs> and I, actually, I had started reading the Seth material when I was in a very severe depression, mm-hmm. and it kind of picked. It was the only thing that picked me out of that depression because suddenly here was something that I I had I literally picked up Seth speaks thinking it would be funny to read at some point. <laughs> And I just, I had been looking, I think, through uh, near death experience research. And for some reason, they kept quoting Seth. And I'm like, why are all these like semi scientific sites referencing Seth? Mm -hmm. And I dug the the book out of, you know, a pile of books and I sat down and I read it and it was just like, wow, okay, this is not what I expected. (laughs) And it it, it kind of lifted me out of that depression. Mm. Yeah, the things, the books, whatever music that sticks with you, you know, uh, I think that it's a lot of timing where you're at with in your yeah, life, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> And also, you know, with these books, have, you know, these books, I don't know, would have had the same impact if they came out today. Um, but would our culture be the same, especially with like psychedelics and, and all this other stuff? Um you know, would The Secret have been a book if it wasn't for the Seth material at some mm-hmm. point? Mm-hmm. Well, before The Secret, there was a lot of books that led to The Secret. Well, yeah, yeah. But a lot of them seem to stem from the Seth material. Like, they're all mm, watered-down okay. versions of Seth material. Yeah. Oh, no, the timing for the Castaneda books, it had to be right then, at yeah. that time, in the uh, late uh, 60s. Yeah, like you said, you know, he was really one of the cornerstones of the counterculture movement. I mean, uh, right along Timothy Leary and, and all those, Albert Hoffman and all those big names. And, you know, for some reason or other, uh, Castaneda fell into obscurity. And I guess he's regaining some notoriety. And I, I actually think it's, think it's a good thing, you know, provided people... Uh, get enough sense of of taking all this material with a grain of salt and also not to to, to fall into uh, a cult situation in which people will yeah. will assure them oh yeah yeah you know 
so and so is actually an, another apprentice of Don Juan, and he'll accept you in your circle provided you give him, you know, ten thousand dollars, something like right. that. All, all your, all your money, all your whole all your money, money and it belong to him. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I thank the two of you. This has been a fascinating conversation. Yeah. And uh, we will have you back, Adam, as well. Obviously, Red Pill joins us regularly. Mm -hmm. Still there, Adam? Oh, I'm sorry. I accidentally hit my uh, mute. <laughs> what, you, what you didn't hear me say was, yeah, thanks for having me on. And uh, I know we are planning on doing a show with Greg Bishop and you and uh, whoever else wants to join us. I don't know if Red Pill is interested or not. On, um... I will oh, I will love to be there just listening to you guys talk about Robert Anton Wilson. I... Thank you. I can't believe I blanked out his name. <laughs> So well, that'll be upcoming at some point in the undetermined future. Sure. All right. And uh, so, yes, thank you, guys. It was a great conversation. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Good talking to you all. Yeah, likewise. Bye-bye.